Well, tonight, in our study of the 66 books of the Bible, we find ourselves at the end of the Old Testament. And no, that doesn't mean we'll be looking at Malachi this evening. We are, in fact, looking at Ezra, so you can begin turning in your Bibles to Ezra. But as we come to Ezra, in more ways than one, we are, in fact, at the end of the Old Testament. Firstly, it's very probable that Ezra and Nehemiah were compiled as a single volume that were later separated. And certainly this has been the historic Jewish view. And in keeping with that understanding, much of our discussion tonight will be applicable to both Ezra and Nehemiah. But we'll save our full walkthrough of Nehemiah until next week. And at the time of the writing of Nehemiah, the Hebrew Bible would have still been a collection of scrolls. And nobody was carrying around their calfskin Hebrew Bible. Because of that, the order of the books of the Old Testament was less fixed. Um, if we limit ourselves to just how the, view, the Jews viewed the arrangement of the scriptures, the order varied as to whether Ezra or Chronicles was the last book of the Old Testament. Um, our oldest complete Hebrew manuscript that has the entire Hebrew, Hebrew Bible actually has Ezra as the last book of the Bible. From the, that's from the 11th century. But I think a case can be actually made that the author of Ezra actually intended his book to be the direct sequel to Chronicles and the true end of the Old Testament. And if you have your Bible open already to Ezra, look down at the first three verses. We'll read them in a few minutes, but for now, just scan them. And if you're like me, you can probably look one page to the left, or flip a page, to the last two verses of 2 Chronicles 36, beginning in verse 22. And you'll notice that these verses are virtually identical. This is not a coincidence. The author intended for us to see the connection between Ezra and Chronicles and with, specifically with Ezra, continuing the story that Chronicles left off with. In fact, 2 Chronicles 36 is fairly critical to rightly understanding Ezra and Nehemiah. When Ezra, Nehemiah, is finally written, Judah's exile in Babylon is over, but so is the ministry of the Old Testament prophets. And Malachi was probably written prior to Nehemiah's second governorship, um, probably sometime around Nehemiah 13.6. And so the written record of Ezra and Nehemiah records the final written revelation from God until he was ready to send his son Jesus 400 years later. So Ezra truly is the end of the Old Testament. And this is helpful for the reader to understand because it underscores the importance of knowing the rest of the Old Testament to truly grasp the context of Ezra especially the prophets. And because we haven't covered the prophets yet, we're going to spend some time looking at them this evening. And that might mean we might not get enough time to talk about your favorite passage in Ezra 7. But I hope to accomplish, what I hope to accomplish the next two weeks is to help you connect the books of Ezra and Nehemiah to the rest of the Old Testament. So for the next time that you come to Ezra in your reading plan, you might read it with a little bit of a broader view. So to help us do that, let's look for a second time at 2 Chronicles 36. You should still be nearby. And this time, let's start reading in verse 19. Then they burned the house of God and tore down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its valuable articles. And those who had escaped from the sword, he took away into exile to Babylon and they were slaves to him and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. And in this passage, we see at least three key events that are highlighted. It is the exile of the people, destruction of the temple, and the destruction of the wall around Jerusalem. And in Ezra and Nehemiah, we see the return of the people, the rebuilding of the temple, and the rebuilding of that wall. So on one level, Ezra and Nehemiah can be seen as a reversal 
of the situation at the end of Chronicles. Not in all respects. So with that, we'll go ahead and put the purpose statement for the book of Ezra up on the screen. And it is that God demonstrates his faithfulness to his promise, promises by sovereignly orchestrating his people's return to the land to rebuild the temple in fulfillment of his promises. And I've got a few passages up on the screen for us, and we'll turn to them in a little bit. And I'm going to leave that up for a second while you, if you're taking notes. But after that, we'll look at the outline of Ezra. And actually, what I have is a joint outline that covering both Ezra and Nehemiah, and we'll just do Ezra tonight. But um, you can see the first section of Ezra is going to be the first return under Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel. The return out of exile came in three different phases. Zerubbabel, ex and then under Ezra, and then under Nehemiah. So in the first section, Ezra 1 through 6, we see the first return under Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel. And then in Ezra 7 through 10, we're going to see the second return under Ezra. Uh, finally, in Nehemiah 1 through 7, we'll see the third return under Nehemiah. That's also when the wall was rebuilt. And then in Nehemiah 8 through 13, we'll be looking at some additional reforms put in place by Ezra and Nehemiah. So broadly, that's just going to structure us. But with that, we want to turn to back to 2 Chronicles 36 again, for the third and final time. But this time, start reading in verse 14. Furthermore, all the leaders of the priests and the people were very unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations, and they defiled the house of Yahweh, which he had set apart as holy in Jerusalem. And Yahweh, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again by the hand of his messengers, because he had compassion on his people and on his habitation. But they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of Yahweh arose against his people, until there was no remedy." By drawing our attention to 2 Chronicles 36, the author forces his readers to first call to mind the reason for the exile. And we shouldn't think about the return without thinking about why the exile happened. And as Ezra's readers read these words while back in the land again, will they be faithful? Will they treat Yahweh as holy? Will they obey his commands to the prophets, or will they instead live like the nations around them, loving the world and the things in the world? When we read Ezra, we should be asking ourselves these same questions. Do I love the world, or do I love Christ? So we'll go ahead and advance to the next slide. We're going to go to the first section, chapters 1 through 6 of Ezra. And here we'll see that the Lord actually returns his people by his sovereignty. In chapter 1, we'll find Cyrus's proclamation that the people should return and rebuild the temple, which is itself a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 44, 28, where Isaiah prophesied that Cyrus, by name, 150 to 200 years before he came, would actually come to subdue the nations and order the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. God is in control of history. But before sending the exiles on their way, Cyrus returns the temple articles taken by Nebuchadnezzar, and he gives them to Sheshbazar, the, the governor of Judah, um, who would serve as their first governor, who would later be succeeded by Zerubbabel. Ezra draws our attention to Chronicles, and then to Isaiah by the mention of Cyrus, and then to another prophet. And let's read verse 1 together. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to complete the word of Yahweh from the mouth of Jeremiah, Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. The author identifies Cyrus's order to return and rebuild the temple as specific fulfillment of his word to the prophet Jeremiah. Now, if you remember Deuteronomy 30, 
or Solomon's prayer in 1 Kings 7, you are already expecting a return of Israel to the land. Turn to Deuteronomy 30, verse 1, and we'll take a look at that briefly. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1, and we'll read through verse 3. So it will be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you cause these things to return to your heart in all the nations where Yahweh your God has banished you, and you return to Yahweh your God and listen to his voice with all your heart and soul, according to all that I am commanding you today, you and your sons. And then Yahweh your God will return you from captivity and return his compassion on you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where Yahweh your God has scattered you. And this is the great hope for Israel in the Old Testament. If they will return to Yahweh and love him with all of their heart and their soul, and if they will listen to his voice and obey it, they will be delivered from captivity. Look at verse 5 in Deuteronomy 30. And Yahweh your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. When Israel returns to the land in genuine repentance and loves the Lord with all of the heart and soul, they would prosper and multiply more than their fathers. What would their temple be like compared to their father's temple? But is this how the return to the land would go for Judah? Would Judah return with all of their heart and soul? Would they obey? Is God even able to accomplish such a restoration with a people as stubborn and and rebellious as Israel? when most of the tribes seem to have disappeared long ago. But Ezra doesn't turn us to Deuteronomy 30, or Ezekiel 20, or 1 Kings 7, or Hosea 1, and all these other passages that speak of the return to the land. This return is a fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. Open your Bibles to Jeremiah 25, verse 11. This whole land will be a waste place, an object of horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And then it will be when 70 years are fulfilled that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares Yahweh, for their iniquity, even the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting destruction. The prophecy, this prophecy was likely given in 605 B.C., the year that Daniel and his companions were taken into exile. God had promised that Judah would serve in Babylon for 70 years. But notice what brings these 70 years to an end. Is it Judah loving the Lord with all their heart and soul? No. These 70 years come to an end because it is time to punish Babylon, which God accomplished through Cyrus. Jeremiah gives another prophecy of 70 years. Turn to Jeremiah 29, verse 10. For thus says Yahweh, When 70 years have been fulfilled for Babylon, I will visit you and establish my good word to you to return you to this place. The coming of Cyrus serves to mark the end of the 70 years spoken by Jeremiah in these two texts. And Judah would return, but would this return be permanent? Would they walk in faithfulness upon their return? Turn back to the book of Ezra, and we'll glance at chapter 2. Try to keep moving quickly. Chapter 2 contains details of approximately 50,000 exiles who returned in the first wave, including Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel, you'll note, is actually in the line of David and in the line of Jesus. And we also see a focus here in this chapter 2 on Jeshua, the high priest, and the importance of having legitimate Levites with verifiable genealogies to ensure that the priesthood reserved for only those who God specified. And priests would certainly be needed with a renewed temple. So Zerubbabel, the Davidic heir, is visible and he's present. But spoiler alert, he won't sit on a throne Judah doesn't yet have their king. In chapter 3, 
In verses 1 through 7, after arriving in Judah and occupying the cities surrounding Jerusalem, apparently Jerusalem wasn't yet inhabited, Jeshua and Zerubbabel gather the people together in Jerusalem. They build an offer, an altar, and they offer burnt sacrifices in obedience to the law of Moses. But notice in chapter 3, verse 3, the people were terrified because of the peoples of the lands. A strong foreshadowing of things to come. In verse 6, they reinstate Jewish feasts and the foundation of the temple had not been laid. In verses 8 through 13, we enter the... Um, uh, we actually see Zerubbabel and Jeshua commence the work of rebuilding the temple, specifically of laying the foundation of the temple. And the people celebrate. The priests are trumpeting. The sons of Asaph are symboling, if that's a word. And they are worshiping as David had commanded. But not everyone is worshiping the same way. And not everybody is celebrating. Let's begin in chapter 3, verse 11. And they sang, praising and giving thanks to Yahweh, saying, For he is good, for his loving kindness endures forever upon Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised Yahweh, because the foundation of the house of Yahweh was laid. Yet many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' households, the old men who had seen the first house of Yahweh, were weeping with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes. While the younger generation rejoiced, the older men who had seen Solomon's temple, who would have been probably part of the last deportation 50 years earlier in 586 B.C., these men were weeping. And they could tell just by looking at the foundation alone that this temple wouldn't measure up to Solomon's. In fact, the prophet Haggai, who we will actually meet in chapter 5, ministered during this time. And Haggai says in chapter 2, verse 3 of Haggai, Who among you remains who saw this house in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem like nothing in your eyes? This wasn't their father's temple. But were these old, weepy men just too preoccupied with the good old days? Were they just discontent that this new temple wasn't what they expected? And we'll look again to the prophets for some insight. In Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48, and you don't have to turn there, about 12 years after the destruction of the original temple, God gave Ezekiel a vision of a new, bigger, and grander temple whose dimensions would actually dwarf Solomon's. And these older men would have been quite aware of Ezekiel's prophecy, which had come in their own lifetimes, in exile, just 34 years earlier. And not only did this new temple not measure up to Ezekiel's, it didn't even measure up to Solomon's. And perhaps it was the first time that it was occurring to these men that this wasn't the long-promised return to the land that they were anticipating. Chapter 4 we remember that Judah feared the people of the land. Well, in chapter 4, we begin to see what it was that they feared. While the people should be building, opposition comes. Turn to Ezra 4.1, and we'll read, Now, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to Yahweh, God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's households and said to them, Let us build with you, for we, like you, seek your God, and we have been sacrificing to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. Well, Judah didn't go into captivity until 605 B.C. The northern kingdom had gone into Assyrian captivity in 722. And according to 2 Kings 17... After the deportation of the northern kingdom, the Assyrian king took men from Babylon and re-inhabited the area of Samaria or the northern kingdom. And in an attempt to appease the god of the land, a misguided attempt, they adopted the syncretistic worship practices 
that were in place in the northern tribe before them. And it appears that they probably intermarried with whatever Israelites were left, and not deported. And according to 2 Kings 17.41, this heritage would be passed down from generation to generation. And this is really helpful background to understand the Jewish Samaritan controversy in the Gospels and the idolatry that is at the heart of it. And these Samaritans offered to participate in the rebuilding effort. Was this an act of sabotage or an act to just proliferate their mixed religion as a rival to Jewish worship? Maybe both. But Zerubbabel rightly refused in verse 3 of chapter 4, you have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God. Well, how do the people respond in verse 4? So the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and dismayed them from building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. The people rightly refused the participation of the Samaritans in the rebuilding effort, but they are fearful and they stopped the work altogether. And This campaign of harassment included discouragement, threatening, lies, conspiracy, all through the use of false counselors. And notice the phrase of how long this occurred at the end of verse 5, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. The opposition was successful in stopping the work for 16 years through the reigns of multiple Persian kings. And there's some application here, brief, is refusal to compromise may bring opposition, right? 1 Timothy 3.12, we read that all who desire to live godly in Jesus will be persecuted. Christ's obedience brought opposition, so were ours. A quick historical note here, keeping the various players straight in this section of Ezra can be a bit of a challenge, especially if you've got the prophecy of Daniel on your mind. Um, There is a Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, in verse 6. And there's also, um, so there's a Darius, the son of, I'm sorry, Darius, the son of Ahasuerus is in in Daniel, and here we have Ahasuerus, the, the son that's of uh, is the, actually the father of Darius, uh, Xerxes. So my notes are confused. This is why I, I'm going through this section. Um, there is a Daniel in the book of Daniel. You've got a Darius and you have an Ahasuerus. In Ezra, you have a Darius and an Ahasuerus. They're not the same. So as we're dealing with here, there's not crossover between those characters and Daniel, which is why it's uh, confusing even for the person talking. Back to Ezra 4. Ezra calls attention to the opposition against the work in chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And this opposition brings a stop to the work under the reign of Darius. But it's here that Ezra actually begins to develop the next section thematically, rather than strictly chronologically. And from 4, 6, all the way to chapter 4, verse 23, he's going to actually trace the history of opposition through multiple leaders and kings of Persia. And so he's going to actually jump into the period of time that's covered by the book of Nehemiah, which can be challenging as I'm trying to figure out what order events happened. Just recognize what he's doing. Once he hits the topic of opposition, he traces that through for another hundred years or so, and then he's going to come back in 423 and then pick up his narrative. And in this section, you should watch out for at least 15 occurrences throughout the book of Ezra that speak of God's active involvement in stirring up individuals to act, in putting desires on kings' hearts, and on his own hand being sovereignly over his people. And so as you read Ezra, you notice the presence of God's active involvement and control of every circumstance And so Ezra's focus, this prolonged focus on opposition, the opposition of the people is set against the backdrop of God's sovereignty. The opposition can never 
derail God's purposes and God's sovereign orchestration of all events. Ezra's readers should understand that it is God who controls history. He cannot be thwarted by human opposition. But before Ezra returns to the narrative in the temple rebuilding, in, uh, there's an important passage for us to look at, chapter 4, verse 21. Now, issue a decree to make those men stop that this city may not be rebuilt until a decree is issued by me. These are the words of Artaxerxes, and he will come back to this decree in the book of Nehemiah concerning the rebuilding of the city uh, because it's important to the storyline of the entire Bible. But for now, just recognize it's here, and we'll actually come back and talk about it next week. And so now we'll pick up in verse 23, actually verse 24, where Ezra resumes his chronological narrative. Then the work on the house of God in Jerusalem stopped, and it was stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So we're now in the year 520 BC, the second year of Darius's reign, and we mentioned there's been a 16-year pause in the temple building because of this intense opposition. And in chapter 5, we'll notice in verse 1, and the prophets Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. And then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, arose and began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. The work on the temple didn't stop because the king ordered it to stop. Because the people stopped out of fear and opposition. But what does God do? He sends two prophets to call the people to continue their work. And if you were reading through your Bible chronologically, this is probably where you would jump off and you'd read through the books of Haggai and Zechariah. Their prophecies start in the second year of Darius. And what did they say that might have given courage to continue with the building effort? Um, I'll probably read these. If you want to try to follow along, you can, but we're going to take a quick dive into Haggai and Zechariah and think, how might this have been encouraging to those who were fearing opposition and needed to rebuild the temple? Haggai 1, verses 4 through 5, it is time for you to yourselves, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house, this temple lies desolate? Haggai tells them, stop polishing your soccer trophies while the temple needs rebuilding. Haggai 2, 4 through 5. Now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares Yahweh. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And all you people of the land, take courage, declares Yahweh, and work. For I am with you, declares Yahweh of hosts. My spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. Haggai 2, 7. I will shake all the nations and they will Come with the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says Yahweh of hosts. And verse 9, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says Yahweh of hosts, and in this place I will give peace. God is with us? He's still dwelling in our midst, even without a temple? That would have been encouraging. He's going to judge the nations and fill the temple with glory? That's good news. Yes, I can keep rebuilding. What did Zechariah have to say? Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. This is the word of Yahweh to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yahweh of hosts. Skipping to verse 9. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. Zechariah promises them that Zerubbabel will succeed by the Spirit of God, and God promises that this work will succeed. That should instill confidence. We've got a guarantee of success. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. Then you will say to him, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Behold, a man whose name is Branch, 
and he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of Yahweh. And indeed, it is he who will build the temple of Yahweh, and he who will bear the splendor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus, he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. A priest and a king in one man. That doesn't sound like Zerubbabel building the temple anymore. Zerubbabel is in the line of David, but he's not a priest. Zechariah 8, verse 3. Thus says Yahweh, I will return to Zion and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Right? They should be encouraged because God will one day dwell again in their midst and his spirit dwells in them now. But he will dwell in their midst when he returns. So there's something different about this dwelling. Zechariah 8, 9. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, let your hands be strong, you who are listening in these days to these words from the mouth of the prophets. Those who spoke in the day that the foundation of the house of Yahweh of hosts was laid, to the end that the temple might be built. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jer Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And this was given to those who were fearful of rebuilding the temple. And this is what they heard from Zechariah. Your king is coming to you. This must be the priest king to come. That's definitely not Zerubbabel. In Zechariah 10.6, I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. Judah is currently in the land alone. Some from the tribe of Benjamin, some Levites, some mixed in, but Judah is missing its fellow tribes. Yet Zechariah says, I will save the house of Joseph, right? or Ephraim, typically known as the largest tribe. Uh, usually it's a stand-in for the other ten tribes of Israel. And I will bring them back. So here we have Judah and Joseph. I will bring them back because of, I have had compassion on them. And they will be as though I had not rejected them, for I am Yahweh their God, and I will answer them. Now he's talking about a return that's not Judah on their own, but involves the other tribes. Zechariah 12.9 And in that day I will... Set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. I don't know about you, it changed me how I read the book of Ezra when I realized these fearful people were the people that, that promise came to. And that future prediction of the suffering Messiah came to. God will regather and will one day pour out grace on Judah. But after their repentance, when they look at him whom they have pierced and mourn, is this the priest king? The readers might have been wondering. But in Zechariah 13, 1, he continues, In that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David, and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for impurity. God promises to cleanse them from their sin. A promise of true cleansing still awaits them. And finally, Zechariah 14, 9. And Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yahweh will be the only one, and his name the only one. Their king their priest king who was promised will come and sit on the throne. And here it is much clearer because this priest king is Yahweh who will be king over all the earth. You can see how Haggai and Zechariah's preaching might stir up in Judah a desire to finish the temple, even in the face of continued opposition. Well, so the work continues. And Immediately, not surprisingly, they encounter opposition again. Chapter 5, verse 3 of Ezra. You need to turn back there. Who issued you a decree to rebuild this temple and finish this structure? Who gave you permission to do this? 
But again, we see God's sovereignty over opposition in verse 5. But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them until a report would come to Darius, and then a written reply be returned concerning it. So the work continues while they await a reply, and in chapter 6, the reply comes. We find a decree from Darius. He finds Cyrus' original decree, and he upholds that decree. In fact, God so favored the Jews that the government officials were not allowed to interfere with the building of the temple. More than that, they had to finance it. Darius even offers to supply it with the necessary animals needed for sacrifice. God is giving them favor in the eyes of the king. And violation of this edict was punishable by death. Turn to Ezra 6.14. And the elders of the Jews were building and succeeding through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edu. So they built and completed it according to the decree of the God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. The temple was completed in the sixth year of Darius, four years after the work had resumed, around 516 B.C., 70 years since it had been destroyed. And consider what a monumental occasion the completion of the temple would have been in Israel. When the tabernacle was completed at Mount Sinai in Exodus 40, we read, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Second Chronicles 7, when the first temple was finished, we read, Now when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and sacrifices, and the glory of Yahweh filled the house. And the priests could not enter into the house of Yahweh because the glory of Yahweh filled Yahweh's house. For the opposite view, before the destruction of the temple, Ezekiel in chapter 8 through 11 of Ezekiel actually contains the sad account of the departure of Yahweh's glory from the temple before its destruction. And this would have been a sad day for Judah when God's glory departed and he no longer visibly dwelt in their midst. But in Ezekiel 43, again delivered during the exile, Ezekiel promised, prophesied again of Yahweh's glory descending on a future temple, just like the first temple, and Yahweh dwelling among them forever. Listen as I read Ezekiel 43, speaking of that future temple, and the glory of Yahweh came into the house by way of the gate facing toward the east, and the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of Yahweh filled the house. And then down to verse 9, Now let them put away their harlotry and the corpses of their kings, Far from me, and I will dwell among them forever. But listen what happened when Zerubbabel finished the temple. Ezra 6, verse 16. And the sons of Israel, the priests and the Levites and the rest of the exiles, celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. And they offered for the dedication of this temple of God 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, And as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, corresponding to the number of the tribes of Israel. And then they appointed the priests to their divisions and the Levites in their orders for the service of God in Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. What's missing from this description? The people rejoiced, sacrifices were offered, but God's glory made no appearance. If it wasn't clear already, The character of the present return to the land was a wholly different nature than the future return described in the prophets. But that hope is still future. So how would we summarize this first section? God's ancient promises remain unfulfilled, but not broken. These promises will still be experienced by a still future generation of Israel who loves Yahweh with all their heart and soul. But it wasn't Zerubbabel's generation. Would it be the next generation? Would it be the generation of Ezra's first readers? 
Zechariah encouraged them with the promise of a coming king, a branch, a priest and king. Would they receive him when he arrived? Zerubbabel has led them well as a governor, but they need a king. With that, we'll turn to the second section on our outline. The second return under Ezra, and this will be the last four chapters of the book. And in this section, we see the people return, and the Lord uses his word to expose their sin. Between chapters 6 and 7, though, a major change occurs. Chapter 6 ended in approximately 516 B.C. with the rebuilding of the temple under Zerubbabel. And that was during the reign of Darius. And now we fast forward nearly nearly 60 years to the reign of his grandson, Artaxerxes. His father was Xerxes, also known as Ahasuerus. There's that other Ahasuerus, who you know from the book of Esther as the one who would marry Esther. He was the one who was king over Persia. But we skip right over him, and we jump into, fast forward being 60 years to the reign of Artaxerxes. We're now about 80 years from the beginning of Ezra 1. Esther would contain the account of some of the Jews that did not return with Zerubbabel. And when we get to Esther, it's helpful to consider that Artaxerxes, being the stepson of Queen Esther, and in Esther, what we'll read about in two weeks is how God used Esther and Mordecai to bring about a favorable attitude in Xerxes towards the Jews, which had to have an effect upon his son, Ahasuerus, or Artaxerxes. And in turn, this would have had a positive impact through Artaxerxes on multiple generations of Jews living in both Judah and Persia. So it's easy to look at Esther as self-contained, but it was affecting things going on in other parts of the world. Well, let's read, as we, after we skip over a 58-year gap between chapter 6 and 7, let's start in verse 1 of chapter 7. Now, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, there went up Ezra, son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalem, son of Zadok, son of Ahitab, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Merioth, son of Zah- Zerahiah, son of Uzi, son of Buki, son of Abishai, son of Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the chief priest. Notice Ezra was a priest. And verse 6, this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses, which Yahweh, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him all that he requested because the hand of Yahweh his God was upon him. No, not only was he a priest, he was a scribe, and as a scribe upon whom God gave favor with the king. God is, in fact, sovereign over history. Skip to verse 8. He came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king, and for on the first month he began to go up from Babylon, and on the first of the fifth month he came to Jerusalem, because the good hand of his God was upon him. And if For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of Yahweh and to practice it and to teach his statue and judgment in Israel. So God gives favor to Ezra, a priest and a scribe, a man dedicated to God's word, and he isn't just interested in God's word for intellectual curiosity, but he is a man dedicated to practicing it, to doing it, to obeying God's commands, and then in teaching it to others. And as we read in Ezra 7, 6, the king granted him all that he requested because the hand of Yahweh his God was upon him. And as we read through chapters 7 and 8, we learn more about what Ezra's request must have included based on what the king actually provides and what Ezra prays about. And Artaxerxes agrees to send Ezra with silver and gold to Jerusalem, and he authorizes further financing for the needs of the temple from the royal treasury. Let's jump ahead to Ezra 7, verse 23. Whatever is decreed by the God of heaven, let it be done with zeal for the house of the God of heaven, so that there will not be wrath against the kingdom of the king and his sons, 
we also make it known to you that it is not allowed to impose tribute, custom, or toll on any of the priests, Levites, singers, doorkeepers, temple servants, or other servants of this house of God. And you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God, which is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges that they may judge all the people who are in the province beyond the river, even all those who know the laws of your God, and to anyone who does not know the laws, you shall make them known. Ezra's role was to proclaim and to teach God's law to these Jews who seemingly have forgotten much of it in the last 60 years. And apparently the temple was in need of repairs already, or perhaps some things maybe were just left unfinished even though it was functional. Ezra's chief concern appears to be further temple repairs and needed reform in the worship at the temple. If worship is to be conducted in the temple as God has instructed, the people need a priest that is skilled in the law and can instruct them. And God raises up Ezra. And look at Ezra's prayer in verse 27 of chapter 7. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of our fathers, who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of Yahweh, which is in Jerusalem, and has extended loving kindness to me before the king and his counselors, and before all the mighty princes. Thus I was strengthened according to the hand of Yahweh, my God upon me, and I gathered chief men from Israel to go up with me. And so here we have the preparations for the second return to Israel. And it's worth noting from 728 on until the end of chapter 9, the author begins to write in the first person, giving evidence that Ezra is likely, again, the one that's writing here. And in chapter 8, we'll actually see a list of those who return in this second wave of exiles. It's probably seven to 8,000 that return in this second wave. And, and we see that there's actually a shortage of Levites. So Lev Ezra has to do some recruiting, and he's able to recruit some more Levites for the 900-mile, four-month journey to Judah. And Ezra considers seeking a military force as protection, but not wanting to lose the support of the king's permission and already abundant provision. Um, the people fast and trust Yahweh, and God answers this prayer. Chapter 8, verse 31, the hand of our God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and the ambushes by the way. And at the end of chapter 8, they arrive, and soon after they arrive, Ezra is presented a challenge. Chapter 9, verse 1, now, when these things had been completed, the work in the temple and depositing the treasures in the temple, the princes approached me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands according to their abominations. Those are the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons so that the holy seed has intermingled with the peoples of the lands. Indeed, the hands of the princes and the officials have been foremost in this unfaithfulness. What did the law say about intermarriage with the nations? Well, you can write down Exodus 34, 12 through 16. And, but I'll read from Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 through 4. And when Yahweh your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it, and he clears away many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations more, prosper, more numerous and stronger than you, and when Yahweh your God gives them over before you and you strike them down, then you shall devote them to destruction. You shall cut no covenant with them. You shall show no favor to them. Further, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me, and they will serve other gods. And then the anger of Yahweh will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. The 
intermarriage of these returning exiles threatened their continual presence in the land. And God had given clear commands against covenanting with the nations and especially intermarrying with them. Why? Because they will turn your sons away from following me. Intermarrying with those who serve other gods will not help you serve Yahweh. In fact, they will draw you away from Yahweh. And this has been the history of the Jewish people all the way back to the wilderness generation when Israel played the harlot with the women of Peor in Numbers. And this moral compromise was seen most strikingly in the lives of the kings of Israel, such as Solomon, right, who were led away from faithfulness to Yahweh by their foreign wives. But now Judah, back in the land, surrounded by their old neighbors, can't resist chasing after the nations again. They haven't been heeding the words and the warnings of the prophets that will lead them like it always had before, straight to idolatry, exile, and God's judgment. And it was the leaders of Judah who were the worst. Judah was once again proving to be unfaithful. We don't have evidence that they actually began worshiping false idols at this time, but that's where they're headed. It would lead there like it does every time. They were not the nation loving Yahweh with all their heart. Clearly, after Zerubbabel and Jeshua passed off the scene, the leaders led the way in unfaithfulness. And oh, how they needed that priest king who Zechariah spoke about that would lead them in true righteousness and bring cleansing from sin. But some did remain faithful. Ezra 9.1 records a handful of the princes that reported to Ezra what was taking place, and there was a remnant of faithful leaders who trembled at God's word in verse 4. In Ezra 9, Ezra prays, and we won't spend time going through the prayer, but it's a great prayer worthy of your time and attention this week. But look at verse 10 of Ezra 9. But what But what can we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by the hand of your slaves, the prophets. And he goes on to quote Deuteronomy 7.3, which I just read. And Ezra recognized that even now, Ezra was receiving far more than they deserved. Read Ezra 9, verse 13. After all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and our great guilt, since you, our God, have requited us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us an escaped remnant as this, so we again break your commandments and intermarry with the peoples who commit these abominations. Would you not be angry with us to the point of destruction until there is no remnant nor any who escape? O Yahweh, the God of Israel, you are righteous. For we have been left an escaped remnant. Again and again, God has been faithful to Israel. In verse 15, the conclusion is in chapter 9, who can stand you before you? Ezra rightly understands the holiness of God. In our sin, none of us can stand before God. And after all this time, Judah still refuses to listen to God. But God has some who are still faithful. And God still hasn't forsaken his promise. But by the end of Ezra 9, it seems Judah is seemingly bent on abandoning their religious identity through returning to the sin of their fathers. Let's talk about intermarriage here for a minute. Ezra 9.14 addresses intermarrying those who commit abominations and entering into covenant with those who didn't embrace Yahweh, right? This would lead the Israelites away from faithful devotion to Yahweh. And what is at stake with intermarriage to the people of the land? It is the worship of Yahweh. Because the religious identities of the peoples were so tied up with where they were from, it can kind of be difficult to distinguish what's at stake. But the core issue was not about racial intermarriage, but religious intermarriage. 
Right? This is evident in the fact that God actually provides a means in the Old Testament for Gentiles to attach themselves to the people of God, to put their faith in Yahweh and become part of the people of God. You can actually see that in Exodus 12, 48 to 49, Numbers 15, 15 to 16, and Isaiah 53, um, 3 through 8. That might be 43. I'll have to check on that reference. Notably, Rahab was a Canaanite. Ruth was a Moabite. Bathsheba, maybe a Hittite, her husband was. And yet all three of these nations were listed in Ezra 9.1. And yet all three were part of God's people who were in the line of the Messiah. In fact, if marriage to a Yahweh-worshipping Moabitess was sin, that would actually make the book of Ruth actually about a rebellious Boaz marrying a foreigner. So let's not misunderstand. This is about religious intermarriage. Faithfulness to God meant not committing with, covenanting with those who did not worship Yahweh. God had no prohibition against intermarrying with foreigners who believed in Yahweh And the same, there is no prohibition for marrying those of another nation or ethnicity in the church. God's design is that these distinctions would disappear in the church. To believe otherwise is to miss the message of Ephesians 2, Galatians 3, and to understand God's plan to redeem some from every tribe, nation, and tongue into one body. In, In recent years, there seems to be a resurgence of opinions from various corners that we should marry only within our own people or ethnicity, sometimes through a misguided sense of loyalty or an ignorant view of God-intended separation. Such ideas, when you encounter them, should be dismissed out of hand as a fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel, the church, and the fact that the believer's allegiance is to Christ. In chapter 9, the people were living contrary to God's word, and they needed to bring their lives in conformity with God's word. And in chapter 10, we see the people around Ezra begin to weep bitterly as well. There's sorrow over the sin of the people. They confess their sin. They enter into covenant to put away their foreign wives and children And any who will not do so actually have their property confiscated and they're ostracized from Judah. And the people do so. And the size of the problem can be seen by the fact that it took three full months to investigate each and every case. Certainly there is complexities and nuance involved. Had this person embraced Yahweh? And then the book finishes with the list of those who married foreign wives and had children and put them away, and then it stops. Well, as I've argued, it continues in Nehemiah, but we'll stop there. And there are lots of questions that arise here about the putting away of these women and children. Were these family members provided for? Were the wives given an option to pledge fidelity to Yahweh before they were put away if they hadn't already? Ezra doesn't answer those questions for us. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in Nehemiah, but recognize here that the leader whom God put in charge here commanded this. And the fact that this decision needed to be made in the first place was a consequence of the people's sin and disobedience. Our sin can have devastating consequences and create challenging decisions for us as to how we try to untangle that sin. There are no good options here. Either allow the nation to sink into idolatry and abandon fidelity to Yahweh or divorce these women. Was there a third option? Well, remember that these women are actual idolaters. They are the ones who practice these abominations who worship false gods. If they had embraced Yahweh, they would have been free to marry them. But they had, in fact, married into the Jewish community and were now under the authority of the Jewish people, including its laws and including the Mosaic law. And what does Mosaic law say should be done with anyone in the land of Israel who serves a false god? Well, you can look at Exodus 22:20 later. But they were to be put to death. 
And perhaps that was the right course. But whether they made the correct choice or not, it appears the leaders were seeking to honor the Lord in their choice, and the people's sin had left them only bad alternatives. And in God's economy, these women actually received mercy by not being put to death. What they needed most was not for their marriages to be preserved, but to embrace Yahweh. It goes without saying that a believer today who is married to an unbeliever is under specific New Testament instructions, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 Peter 3, on how they are to live with an unbelieving spouse. They're not free to divorce without restriction. An application, a number of applications for the book of Ezra. Praise God for his sovereignty. He controls history. No circumstance is outside of his control. No obstacle can thwart his purposes. Be wary of your love for and attachment to this world. Time after time, it continued to bring devastation to Judah, to Israel, and it will to us. Confess your sins. The people saw their sin when God's word was shown to them. And Ezra called them to actually do something about it. We see they, they confessed and they repented. They changed their actions. Let your sorrow over your sin lead you to change. Give up your sin. God has provided forgiveness by Jesus Christ. Believe that Jesus came, became sin on our behalf. He is our priest king. He is the one spoken about. He is the one that Zechariah encouraged these, ex, these newly returned exiles with the truth of his soon one day return and reign. Long for that day and live in light of that day. Even though our current experience might just be a faint glimpse of the future realities of that kingdom, may, it, may that kingdom be a motivation to serve him where we find ourselves today, just as it sh- was intended to be a motivation for those first hearers. We see Ezra's example to study, obey, and teach God's word, prioritize God's word in your own life. And we didn't spend much time in the prayer, but God, we see in the book of Ezra that God hears the prayers of his people, and he uses them to accomplish his good purposes. We, we read in Ezra that in their prayer and in their fasting and their supplication, they prayed to God and he heard their entreaty and he kept them safe on the way to Judah from Babylon. God hears our prayers. Finally, a word to those perhaps dating, perhaps engaged, perhaps thinking about it. God in his providence puts people into marriages with unbelievers. But we don't walk into those intentionally and bind ourselves to an enemy of Christ. If you are looking and contemplating that, end it today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the the book of Ezra. Lord, we thank you that we see that you are good and you are patient and you keep your promises and you keep your ancient promises. You kept your promises to bring Israel out of the land even though they had not yet repented from the heart. But yet you kept your word. And there is a day coming when you in fact will bring them into the land in obedience and in faith. And but Lord, we thank you that their hardening has provided an opportunity for us to be beneficiaries of the, of the riches of your grace. Lord, as, as Ezra prayed that you haven't treated us, you haven't, as our sin deserves. Lord, we thank you that you haven't, you've given us far greater than we've ever deserved in Christ. In your name we pray, amen. Well, one source um, 
if you're trying to read through Ezra and you're trying to put the details together, the historical details, um, there is a short 130-page commentary um, that covers both Ezra and Nehemiah, so very readable, uh, by the name of, the author's name is J. Carl Laney, last name is L-A-N-E-Y, published by Moody. Might not help you dig through all the prophetic passages, the applications sometimes are strange, but it really does a good job of putting the historical details in the relationship between Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and Esther kind of in, in order that makes sense. So I'd commend that to you. Have a good evening. You're dismissed.